Hi, good morning. It's Jim from Math Star Observatory. Um, today, I've been looking at the maps, and when you look at maps like that was released at the beginning of the year, this one, uh, for instance, the US UK World Magnetic Model that was updated of the world main field intensity or total intensity. Um, it's very difficult when you look at the top right hand corner and see where the magnetic north pole is, is to gauge exactly where that is on this sort of epoch map. So I went on to North School and using the coordinates that we've got from our TriMag system, uh, just two grid references, uh, you know, like um, 83 degrees north by 124 degrees, I think it is, east off the top of my head. Um, you'll see it in a minute, and anyway, we'll bring up the other maps. It's very difficult to imagine where the magnetic north pole is. I'm just wondering why they didn't, you know, release a series of different maps so that we could get a real idea as to the exact position with regards to Siberia, where the magnetic north pole is. So I thought. You know, I'd spend a bit of time uh, using the maps and, you know, give you that location on three different versions so that you get a better idea. And I'll save the best till last, guys, because, you know, the last map really does show us where the magnetic north pole is on the northern hemisphere of our Earth. So let's go and have a look. So as you can see on this map, top right hand corner, that little white dot is where Noah claim the magnetic north pole is and if you look at the coordinates they're not too far away from where we're saying the magnetic north pole is or at least our TriMag equipment is stating that the magnetic north pole is in that region so let's have a look on the other maps so we get a better idea as to where it is so I think I'm using W3 uh, map on North School and we've selected the space view so obviously that green mist that you see across the northern hemisphere is the aurora today and where the little green circle is is where the magnetic north pole is now if we compare that with the epoch map that Noah showed us it looks very similar but still doesn't give us a clear idea over the northern hemisphere of where the magnetic north pole is so playing about with uh, North School I think I was using the equilateral triangle uh, map or the epoch map equivalents and um, you know that wasn't really giving me what I wanted so I just went with the standard O map which is like the globe and then flipped it over over to the northern hemisphere and we got a better idea as to where the magnetic north pole is and in the direction almost where it's moving so let's go and have a look at that that map right now so we're using the O map on North School and what you can see is just slightly off center uh, the little green circle uh, which is at around 83 degrees north by 124 degrees east to two grid references. Um, if you want a real high accurate um, you know, grid reference then just go on to uh, Earth Health at a glance and you'll get the full, I think, four or five grid references for the magnetic north pole, um, giving it an accuracy of probably within two or three miles, uh, probably even more accurate than that. But as you can see, uh, this gives us a better idea as to where the magnetic north pole is over the northern hemisphere. We're looking down over the globe, and most people can relate to that, as opposed to the EPOC map that you know uh, NOAA put out or released earlier January this year. So just to try and help people, you know, get a better understanding as to where our magnetic north pole is, where it's heading, and reason why it's heading. These are the questions that people have asked, but not really got answers from anywhere else other than our observatory. And what we're trying to do is just inform people as accurately and honestly as we can as to the position of the magnetic pole, its migration speed, and its direction which it's heading. If we just go back over to the other map, um, I'll explain why it's left Canada uh, during the 1900s and why 120 years later it is where it is. So here we are back on the World uh, Magnetic Model uh, 2020, which is this year's release of the total field intensity. And we've got two regions over the Northern Hemisphere. They're almost, uh, you could say, two magnetic North Poles. I have, uh, you know, came out and told people about two years ago that we actually had four magnetic poles on our planet. 
and th I think that this is proof in itself that we're looking at the two intensities over the northern hemisphere there is a, a stronger one over the southern hemisphere and slightly weaker one towards the Falkland Islands um, which is uh, weakening uh, as well but not at the same rate as the one in Canada is so 120 years ago the earth enjoyed a fixed magnetic north pole um, over Canada and it enjoyed that for 780,000 years so quite a long time but only in the recent 120 years as it started to migrate and migrated around 1700 miles over the northern hemisphere and is making its way to this high intense region over Russia and the epicenter of this high intensity region in Russia is just below the Arctic Circle and we know that because of the weakening of can you know the Canadian intensity uh, the pole has been drawn over towards the increasing intensity in Russia and it will at some point make its way to this epicenter over here in Russia which is just like I say below the Arctic Circle why did it begin to migrate this is something we are still efforting our best guess on because we don't see what's going on under the crust of the earth we we are led to believe with the standard model that the magneto is what generates uh, the poles on our planet as well as the protective shield the magnetosphere and you know we are still trying to work out what is going on with that and why in the first place it does set up a magnetic field it is said that there is swirling molten material that generates the um, magnetic or the magneto which generates the poles and the magnetosphere but it's not been proven in any laboratory we have tried to replicate it by rotating molten sodium metal and failed miserably so we don't quite understand what it is uh, with the mechanism that sets up the magneto to start with and you know because we haven't recorded anything over the last uh, magnetic full pole reversal which took place 780,000 years ago we don't quite know what to expect right now and you know if you've been following me we have had emails from NASA saying you know Gene we agree with what you're saying and we do understand some of the possible consequences of what this could cause but as an organization we're not prepared to come out and release anything either way because we don't want to lose credibility as a result if we get it wrong so that just shows you the level of uncharted territory that we are in right now. It's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the magnetic pole reversal on our planet, because not only is it one of the rarest events that takes place and is currently taking place in our lifetimes, and we may even see within the next two to three years, you know, when we go past that 40 degree mark, the magnetic poles reverse on our planet. It will be a unique opportunity uh, uh, to collect this data and record it for future generations and you know it will be um, a little scary as well because we just don't know exactly what to expect as a result of this but what we have learned and what I've learned over the probably the last decade of studying this topic is that as we have seen a slight decrease in the magnetosphere we have witnessed more cosmic rays coming into our atmosphere and as it continues to get closer to that point where it reverses we will have a lot more cosmic rays come through our atmosphere and in turn create you know elementary particles such as neutrons protons um you know muons etc etc we're going to see a lot more of this and we do know as a result of those things it don't just change the climate with regards to seeding the upper atmosphere it also has a health effect on all the biodiversity across the range it does cause cancer and if more of it is on the increase then we can expect cancer rates to increase and we know that it also also is capable of affecting the cardiac arrhythmic uh, a rhythm of your uh, heart so you know as a result of that we could possibly see more uh, cases of people needing pacemakers or you know an increase in heart attacks as a result of that and you know that is just one aspect health reasons you know with regards to the the biology of uh, human anatomy and animal anatomy and also plant anatomy but the other um, aspect of this is the changing of the climate 
and that is serious enough in itself because when we start to see like we have been recording over the last few weeks you know the levels of floods around the world we've seen places like um vietnam have four cyclones in one uh october month and as a result you know it has displaced and flooded out over 200,000 people and that's not to say uh, or not to mention the damage it's done to the agriculture in that country as well as a result of that you know if you're over here in the UK we've probably had a few hours here and there of no rain and uh, you know I'd, I'd, I could find out if I wanted to you know invest a little bit of time as to how much precipitation we've had and I would just love to know how much precipitation we've had over the last couple of weeks compared to how much we averagely have in an October month uh, during the whole month of precipitation I'll bet you we have probably broke that record so you know this is what we're going to expect uh, we're going to expect more flash floods uh, you know where the jet streams don't run we're going to expect droughts and if it's in the northerly latitudes we can expect that during the colder months to turn into snow and you know in the more uh, tropical regions of our planet it's going to end up like what we're seeing in Vietnam now you know torrential rains causing torrential floods and creating disasters wiping out crops as a result and that's why this topic guys is so important that's why i'm so passionate about it and that's really you know why every day you know i mention that there is a link there you can support it it's a publicly funded observatory and you know it really does deserve a bit of a support you know it does require i think more people to step up to that line and back what we're doing because i think we're doing a better job than some of these big organizations that have you know very deep pockets they can invest millions of pounds pay people wages and salaries and you know they can have a lot of experts on this hand where the Mavstar Observatory is concerned there's just myself and sometimes it's a struggle just to get a wage together you know in order to do this work despite you know me having to be the electronics engineer the programmer you know build the equipment design the equipment and get it out there in the field running a website and um, you know a YouTube channel and trying to you know keep people's enthusiasm going it, it does require as you would imagine a lot of work and you know it's, it's just a shame sometimes when we get to this point of the year you know the um, level of support drops off and it's a struggle to keep people um, motivated uh, to you know keep us supported here you know if a few more people was to step up to the line we wouldn't have to you know desperately ask to you know ha have some help to fund our observatory so I'll leave it there guys hopefully we've give you a clearer picture as to where the magnetic north pole is over the no northern hemisphere of our planet and um, we'll leave it there you know I'll say what I usually do you have a good time uh, you know look after your loved ones and as always bye for now